and it looks like we're live. Welcome to the Atlas Project. My name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow with the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm here in New York with Greg Salmeri. I, Hello. This is, uh, I think, my fourth trip to New York for this uh, project, and this is, of course, a weekly chapter-by-chapter -chapter reading group about Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged. Uh, part of the reason that I'm here this week is because this is uh, the second week we're talking about Galt's speech, which is the climactic uh, speech of the novel, uh, goes on for 90-some uh, pages and takes three hours to read, uh, and in many ways sums up and condenses Ayn Rand's overall philosophy of objectivism. Um, so we're going to, Greg's going to give us an agenda for what we're going to discuss tonight in a minute, but before uh, he does that, I'll just quickly remind people one of the big reasons that we're doing this project is uh, in part to promote uh, the Institute's essay contest for Atlas Shrugged. And students who are interested in winning up to $10,000, uh, please check out the links that I put in the comment section uh, to this post on Facebook. Uh, there's link, a link there to uh, instructions about the essay contest, more uh, on the topics you can enter. That comes due in May, about a month after we finish, and we're only about a month away from finishing, which is hard to believe. We've been through, uh, well, I mean, we're right about, we're right about here and in the book. I'll put our timeline back. And Greg's, gonna, and as you can see, this train is about to reach the station. So, Greg, what did you think we were going to discuss tonight? All right, so we talked last time, and uh, we started talking about this chapter, chapter seven of part three, which contains Galt's speech, uh, last Tuesday. And then Ben and I, we did a supplemental session uh, from Jersey City without our, collected, uh, our collective here uh, on it. And so we are, we've spent a fair amount of time on this today. I think we're probably going to end up taking two hours, as we sometimes do, and try to finish up the speech. In both of the last two broadcasts on it, we spoke about the structure of the speech, and there are a couple of different ways of dividing it up. The way I think is most useful for f situating yourself in it is in this five-point outline, uh, which is my condensation of Alan Godhouse's summary of the speech. I put the outline back up on the screen. There's an introduction, a section in which Galt presents his positive philosophical views, the morality of life, a section in which he describes the morality that he thinks people in the society outside, and I think by extension in our society outside the world of the book, have accepted. That section we can call the morality of death or the morality of sacrifice. And then there's a section on the teachers of the morality of death or the morality of sacrifice, uh, who he also calls mystics. And then finally there's a section at the end where he encourages his audience, who is in some sense they've been living by this morality of death, but they're not the fountainhead, their chief um, people responsible for it, to come over to his side, to choose the morality of life. And we've talked about the first three of these sections in our previous broadcasts. Uh, we talked about sections one and two and just a little bit of section three uh, when we were here last Tuesday night uh, over the, um, from Jersey City when we did the supplemental broadcast. Ben and I reviewed some stuff from one and two, talked a little bit more about two, and talked a lot about the morality of death section, section three. So what I want to do mostly today is talk about sections four and five, talk about the view of the mystics or the teachers of the morality of death, and then talk about the, the longest of these sections, the last section where Galt talks about the choice that is are confronting the people of the world and uh, why they should choose uh, his type of morality. And as part of that, you get a lot of Galt's view of self-esteem. You get some indication of what Galt thinks is going to happen as this strike draws to a close and what his plans are. And I think we need to talk about that uh, to understand the role of this in the plot. So we're basically going to be talking about sections four and five of the speech today. But I want to, especially since we didn't say much about uh, part three of it when we had the New York group uh, uh, last Tuesday, just see if there are any unfinished business, any major points from the earlier uh, part of the speech that this people, is the part of the morality of death. Yeah, that which people are we did talk about it in, uh, in we, the supplemental broadcast. Is, so I was saying we're going to talk tonight about the last two sections of the speech, parts four, the part on the teachers of the morality of death, and part five, where Galt's um, giving his pitch to people to accept the morality of life, to join him on the strike. But I wanted to just spend a little bit of time at the beginning of today 
uh, taking care of any unfinished business from parts two and particularly part three of the speech, anything that the New York group wants to add that they'd like uh, to hear some discussion of, or anyone online if you kind of chime in on that very quickly. But time for us to see you before we move on. So any topics from uh, roughly before page 1034 in the standard edition, if you all hold the speech that way in your minds, that anyone's interested in talking about? I'm springing this on you guys, so likely not. Okay, good. Then let's move to, um, to part four, where we start to talk about the teachers of the morality of death, uh, who Galt calls mystics. And he's introduced, he calls them your teachers, the teachers of this morality, and then he often calls them mystics. He's introduced already by this time the idea of two types of mystics um, that are associated with the two parts of the division between spirit and body, which division he commented on uh, and, and railed against in his discussion of the morality of death. And so these are the mystics of spirit, as he calls them, and the mystics of muscle. So um, basically, who Galt seems to mean by the mystics of spirit are, um, or mysticism of spirit, let's put it that way, seems to be religion and maybe um, philosophies that, um, like Platonism, for example, which um, speaks about a higher world beyond this one that um, you can maybe hope to go to when you die and uh, is where true ideals lie and so forth. So um, I think under this heading we would put religion um, and, or Galt would put religion and any kind of um, philosophy that's dualistic uh, that is, holds the distinction between mind and body, or spirit and body, and puts all the value on the side of spirit and thinks of the body as some crummy thing we're stuck with for now but want to try to transcend or get past. Um, we'll talk more about why he thinks ill of these people in a moment, but it might be a little less obvious who the mystics of muscle are. So what is mysticism of muscle? I think there are some definite philosophies that are fall under this heading that we can recognize. Thoughts on this? Alex? Well, Karl Marx for certain was the one because he believed that machinery arises without a mind to produce it. Yeah, and a lot of the, the ideas that are, um, that are um, shown as the ideas of the mystics of muscle seem to be right out of Marxism. And we've seen a lot of, you know, the material conditions um, will uh, condition your mind and so forth. So we've, Marxism's been a kind of uh, foil for Rand's views for some time. Anna? Hobbes? Um, you might think the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who's a... B stroke life would be short, nasty, and brutish. Um, <laughs> is the quote that he he does say that. He is a materialist. And he is a materialist in philosophy. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see anything in the novel that's sort of a direct allusion to Hobbes. Oh, oh, I didn't know but I do think he's someone who she probably would think of as in that broad camp. That's what I was talking about. Uh, and Will, did you have... Uh, utopian philosophies in general. Uh -huh. What I was thinking of was a passage in the Screwtape Letters, uh -huh. where Screwtape tells his nephew, you should urge your patient to think of the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was very similar to something Keith Galt says, mm -hmm. as a promised land and not something which everyone is attaining at the rate of 60 minutes an hour. <laughs> Yeah, so... Between his point and Alex's, I should just mention uh -huh. that, you know, there's, it's not just Marx and it's not just a handful of utopian socialists. There's a whole secular left-wing tradition that comes out of that mix uh -huh. in Europe and it's the dominant intellectual orthodoxy in yeah. universities today in one form or another and there's many different forms. Or at least it was then because we don't, I don't think we really have a utopianism on the left today no. of the sort that we had... Uh, at this time, which is what Rand's described, right? So there's the idea that we will make it to the ideal society in another five years, or five years after that, or five years after that, or at some indefinite point in the future, there'll be a new kind of man. And Marx is the sort of obvious, or, you know, the, the most marquee example of this. But there are these other utopian traditions that, as I think Lewis uh, and Rand both thought, um, though as much else they disagreed about, right? Secularized the idea of paradise. Um, it's a paradise that will be reached by our descendants sometime in the future when they learn to be, well, very different from how we are now. How Galt's own future that he's looking forward to is different than that is something we might want to discuss. 
There's another category. Oh, Earl, did you want to chime in on these? Uh, no, I, I don't know. It's a little speculative, but included in the uh, chicken and egg thing would be mm -hmm. uh, Spencerian evolution, that you fly because you have wings, not because you desire to fly. Um, see, to me, that connects. But. Well, that the, some, some kinds of views of evolution, Lamarckian kind of views anyway, are, are often associated with the Marxist tradition. The, the other kinds of view that I think falls for her under mysticism of muscle is... I and mean, the person who most stands out, you, you might think Freud, and I think he would fall under this category for her, but B.F. Skinner in particular. And Floyd Ferris looks an awful lot like B.F. Skinner to me. Um, and she wrote a, a noteworthy uh, nonfiction essay, uh, this skewering was, Skinner. Yes, yeah, skewering his as book if Beyond is, she'd Freedom. She had been predicting this for a long time. His book Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which was written sometime uh, after Atlas Shrugged, might as and well her review be, why do written. you think you think? Yeah, if you, Beyond Freedom and Dignity is a really striking, I mean, Walden too is also, but Beyond Freedom and Dignity in particular is a really striking book and strikingly like what Ferris wrote. I mean, if, uh, I think Ferris is somewhat meant to be a caricature of this, uh, but people say no one would write like that, and the answer is, well, he's somewhat a caricature of it, but then you pick up Beyond Freedom of Dignity and it's not even really a caricature. I mean, what kind of a name for a book is that? And uh, if you read it, it's not a disturbing book. He's not pulling his punches. As well as, yeah. Um, so I think these are the kinds of concrete, real-world intellectuals that she has in mind as uh, falling under these headings of mystic of spirit and mystics of muscle. What about in the novel? Well, in the novel, we have as an example of a mystic of muscle, Ferris, who we were just talking about. Um, I think we have the various people who are seen espousing Marxism at one point or another would be under this. Uh, Simon Pritchett, I think, also falls under this heading in the novel. He's more of a minor character. He's a philosopher who's drooling some woozy mysticism, as Stadler puts it. Um, what about mystics of spirit? Well, we don't have any professional mystics of spirit, right? We don't, like, Floyd Ferris is someone whose job it is to promulgate ideas, and what he promulgates is this kind of anti mind Skinnerian mysticism. We don't Ma have... Ma Chalmers. Ma Chalmers with her cult of Oriental mysticism. Yeah, I guess she would be our closest uh, to a professional, someone who's... There's a few street preachers jobs. who make appearances. Street, street speechers? But Carrie Ann? Oh, I, I kind of think that Lillian... Mm -hmm. Wangles her way into that category too. She claims to be, you know, non-material. Yeah. She uh, upholds the spiritual thing that other people are supposed to sacrifice. I think that's right. So Lillian, mm -hmm. um, Jean Lawson too. I think the bank Jean the Lawson. There, it's these people are. Um, they're not preachers, but they're people who. They're more than just people who hold some mystical beliefs. They're really big exponents of them. I think Jim Taggart also seriously falls into this category. But for all of these characters, I think it's a little bit ambiguous whether you'd call them mystics of muscle or mystics of spirit. Reardon's mother seems to be a fairly conventionally religious person. She talks in terms of sinning. We've sinned against you, Henry. And um, Lillian seems to veer towards mysticism of spirit as opposed to of muscle, but um, it's not quite, you know, um, she doesn't use like traditional religious language much, for There example. was originally going to be uh, uh -huh. a priest in the yeah. story named Father Amadeus. This is an interesting character, an who interesting Who I believe idea. was supposed to be something like Jim's confessor. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you maybe even see some remnants of that insofar as Jim had, you know, you see Jim's mysticism yeah. is, is more in a Christian mystical direction than a Marxist one at certain times, at least. Yeah, uh, now the, but he, she ended up cutting him because uh, she thought. Uh, well, the idea with he'd be psychologically unrealistic because he well, was eventually supposed to. Yeah, go the, over I, the good side. The idea somehow. of Father Amadeus was he was going to eventually join the strike, right. and he was going. Jim was going to try to confess to him, and he was going to say, "Sorry, Jim, I'm on strike," um, and so he was going to be a. a um, it's not, not clear to me whether he would then give up his religion and go on or what the, the idea was, but he was a moral leader who was a priest, and I guess was meant to be like a Thomist kind of character. Um, but she said she cut him because she didn't think she could make such a character realistic. So, um, but that's, yeah, so he would have been... But then the question is, would he have ever been a mystic? Um, if he was a Thomist. Yeah, and if he was the well, kind of person who could join the strike. So. 
we, we still need to figure out what a mystic is supposed to be in this conception. Yeah. So maybe we should. So that brings that. us to that question. What, is, what does she think of these two variants, religion, or at least some types of religion, and uh, or some degrees of commitment to religion, and Marxism as uh, along the same along the same lines. Which is and a surprising is it view because the Marxists mysticism? are typically atheists and mm -hmm. consider themselves non-religious and secular and mm -hmm. not and mystical. Scientific. And scientific. And scientific. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, we've already talked about someone on the chat, and I can't see the names. Uh, someone on the chat mentioned Reardon Mother, who I've mentioned. It's Dan. Uh, Dan, and, and someone, Ivy Several Starnes. Several mentioned Ivy. Um, and you made a point about Ivy, Ben, that I think is significant to the, con what Rancy is the connection between these types of Yeah, well, she, she starts out, of course, as the, as the leader of the plan at 20th century to implement from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, which is the classic Marxist line. So you can infer that that's more of her orientation, but then, of course, she ends up transitioning to Buddhism, Mm -hmm. um, and this isn't the only example in, at least in Rand's fiction, where you see this kind of transition happening. Uh, you had, for instance, in The Fountainhead, Ellsworth Toohey, who's kind of the arch villain of that book, uh, is, we get his history to some extent, and he starts out as religious, but then goes in the other direction. He's a kind of Marxist organizer. Becomes more of a Marxist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and we have in, in the speech on, on 1056, Galt says, uh, you blank out the fact that most mystics of muscle started out as mystics of spirit and that they keep switching from one to the other. So his view is sort of whether you're a religionist or a Marxist or a Skinnerian is sort of incidental. And even the same people flit around from one to the other. There's some common core that these things are uh, different, uh, different expressions of. And so what is this common core then supposed to be, which is a mysticism? And we asked a question about this right online. Yeah, uh, I got a few different answers. So Schuyler, for example, said that uh, mystics are anyone, any person who subscribes to irrationality, either the supernatural or the earthbound version, and, and preach death as beca because of that. Uh, Alex, who's with us tonight, said they deny reality and try to force their wishes and delusions on others. They preach death. They divorce mind and body. They try to escape identity and causality. You got a lot of the headlines. Uh, that was good. Um, yeah, Mike had raised the issue of can't there be rational mystics, and uh, JG had responded, no, uh, not, not the way Ayn Rand defines well, mystic. So this, I mean, this raised a, this, that little debate that happened mm -hmm. in our discussion raised a question for me because there's there's a terminological question here about whether. Rand is using the word mysticism in the way that most people usually use it, if they use it, um, which is a question they ask a lot about, about a lot of her terms. But I, I, in my sense, the kind of popular usage of the term mysticism, uh, well, first, it's, it's often used by religious people to distance their particular religion from another religion that they see as kind of far out uh, or, you know, like, like New Agey, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, but but Rand seems to be using it well, as even, a kind of broader term I would that think, encompasses both. I would think some religious people who think ill of mysticism use it for some other type of religious beliefs that aren't like ours. But, but there are also yeah. some who proudly say, I have a more mystical type of religion. So I think within religiosity, there's a kind of distinction that, that people draw that's not meant, like this is a term of abuse. Some people proudly think of their religion as mystic and someone else's is not and and vice versa. So she's clearly using it in a broader sense, has a, especially if it also includes Marxism. Yes, but she has a broader really sense in mind. What is it then that's the narrower sense? Like if some religions are mystic and some are not. I mean do people have thoughts on this? Or some variants of religion or some religious thinkers have a mystical bent and others don't? In my experience, it's usually applied to, you know, people who, the sort who uh, probably say these days, I'm spiritual, not religious, uh -huh. and are putting emphasis on direct contact with the divine or the world soul, etc., 
mm -hmm. and especially not going through any clergy or hierarchy as intermediaries. Yeah, Daron in the chat yeah. mentions the examples of Kabbalah and Sufism, which mm -hmm. are the Jewish and Muslim Very mystic yeah. sects. So there sects. are two things. Someone might say I'm mystical as opposed to into organized religion, right? Because I think all of us could have this direct spiritual contact. You could be someone like the, um, who thinks the clergy has this sort of direct contact that I don't. And so you can think of the, someone within organized religion as being a mystic leader. Um, if you think, you know, God's got a direct line to some guy, right? And then he might not have it to you, but then that guy would be the mystic. You wouldn't be the mystic, but you would be, you know, a student of a mystic. Well, or something. Common, common to that point, uh -huh. th all those examples, is that is the, the ones who have the direct line uh, are the ones who think that they've got a kind of intuitive uh, grasp of the truths of their religion, right. which is which is to you know connecting to the point that um, who was it Mike was making. Um, but if Rand thinks that this whole other class of people are mystics too, is 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 her view totally detached from that conception, or is her idea that well there's there's more uh, sophisticated and intellectual rationalizations that you could give for why you should be able to rely? Uh, on intuitive grasp of uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you truths. if you posit a kind of thing that I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to call it religiosity anymore, but like deism, where you think you've got a proof that there's a god, mm -hmm. you think you believe only in the particular things you can prove about, or even like a John Locke kind of religion, where you get some deistic proof, and then you think you have evidence that the biblical God is the same one, that it's testimonial evidence. You take really seriously what the standards of evidence are. Maybe you're wrong about, but your But that's you, not mysticism. But your view is, I believe this just because here's how I can uh, tell, and I'm no strongly, more strongly committed to the belief than the evidence is, and you're really diligent about that. I think that's not what you would think of as mysticism. So mysticism is not coextensive necessarily with religion. If you, if oh, there could sure. be a rational religion, you're saying. Well, and there I might don't not know, be. but the the question is, is it really possible to have that constellation of views, or right. is it possible now, Anna? So, I'm trying to follow this. Isn't mysticism more focused on on how the person arrives at the ideas? Yeah, I think that's right. It, or that's her way of thinking. And and she's saying those who reject reason outright. So you might have religious people, especially in the 1700s, but even now, I mean, they, they'll they be very rational. They go to work and, be very, and, and some of them can be brilliant, and they accept reason. Mm -hmm. But you know, on, on Sundays they may go to church. But, but you know, it's, they're not mystics. If you, right. if you meet them, you wouldn't well, think, oh, that person's a total mystic. I mean, you might say he's but religious. But you could but say the religion, so there are two issues we might have, right? One is, you might have someone whose religion is mysticism. But his religion fully counts as mysticism. But if you look at the guy and how he lives his life, the whole story about him isn't, you know, this guy's a mystic. He's a guy who works nine to five, and then he does a little bit of mysticism on Sunday. Um, so there's one view you might have where the, the, the theory the guy holds about God or whatever is mystical, but that's just one thing about him. And if you add up everything about him, that's comparatively unimportant. The other question is, are there views that would count as religious views, where even in the person's religious life, you wouldn't say he's being mystical? Yeah. Maybe he's wrong, or maybe right. you know. But you have to have a logical proof of God, like Aquinas, maybe. Or maybe know. someone like Locke. Who was holding the I mean, in her non-fiction, even Aristotle, or Swedenborg, or Aristotle. I, mean, I, I don't couldn't really understand why people call him a mystic. Just because someone talks to angels, does that mean he's a mystic when he's being very rationalistic in his theology? So I don't know yes. enough about him to comment on him in particular. <laughs> but um, so like, take but, somebody like Kant, for instance, uh -huh. who's, who's a frequent target of Rand's writings. And I think, given everything she's saying, and here she would regard him as a mystic of one kind or another, yes. he's got an incredibly sophisticated intellectual system right. with arguments and uh -huh. antinomies and uh, yes. transcendental deductions and so forth. But uh, so it can't just be any kind of argument it's not just a, you and you. And what are the arguments there arguments. for is the yeah. big question. What are they aimed at accomplishing? And if I would think that what she would say is if what they're aimed at accomplishing is rationalizing a certain kind of knowing, to Anna's point, mm -hmm. right? Showing that he, you know, because in his his intention, he had to, he wanted to limit uh, knowledge in order to make room for belief. 
that would be a sophisticated defense of a kind mysticism. of mysticism. I think, I mean, what Wren says in some of her nonfiction writing, in, in, I guess it's in, I forget if it's in Faith and Force or if it's in the Objectivist Ethics. In one of those essays, she defines mysticism as the view um, that there's a superior form Kucha of knowledge. actually just quoted this. Oh, course. good. Mysticism is uh, the acceptance of allegations without evidence or proof, either apart from or against the evidence of one's senses and one's reason. Mysticism is mm -hmm. the claim to some non-sensory, non-rational, non-definable, non-identifiable means of knowledge, such as instinct, intuition, revelation, uh, or any other form of just knowing. Thank you, Puja. And if you claim that and, and then attempt to be rational in the context of that, I think Rand would still count it as mysticism. Um, but now this is just the epistemic side of mysticism. And Anna, this is what you were calling our attention to, and I think that's, at least in her other writings, Rand thinks of it primarily as an epistemic doctrine. Maybe in Atlas she does also, where Galt does also. But, but it's going to have a, implications for other views yeah. of philosophy. But it's, there's a real metaphysical and ethical side to it here, too. And I think we'll see more about it and get more of a sense of what she means by it as we look at the kind of range of theories she thinks of as mystical and what, what she thinks of as mystical about them. Al, you want to? Yeah, um, I can't. I can't think of a reference by Ayn Rand to this issue, but my own thinking about mysticism is that we've been speaking so far about its positive content. I see it as essentially hostile, mm -hmm. hostile to the notion that an individual using his or her mind can discover reality and discover what's right and wrong. And my personal example is Whitaker Chambers, who was a mystic of muscle, became a mystic of spirit and spewed the worst kind of venom about Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand. That's a good segue to our next topic, right, which is the psychology of the mystic. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a, a claim that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's what motivates the mystic is what we asked about. And um, there's quite a lot about the motivation and the psychology of mystics in this chapter. Right? And that's itself interesting, because what exactly is mysticism? Is it a, a, a theory that has, as, as Galt thinks of it, is it like a certain ideological position that you could argue for or against and debate the merits of, and then it's just a really bad one? Or is it some kind of like vice or psychological syndrome? Or is it an ideological position, but that's... Um, born out of some kind of vice or psychological, uh, you know, um, uh, problem. So uh, somebody asked epistemic uh, in, with a question mark online. So if you're asking what that word means, uh, epistemology answer. is the branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge. Episteme is one of the Greek words for knowledge. So epistemological or epistemic means having to do with knowledge or the theory of knowledge. Um, Okay, so let's talk about what Galt says about the motivation of the mystics of muscle. And uh, at one point he says the whole of their shabby little secret is something, and he kind of, uh, he, he stretches out, he, uh, he spells out that the whole of their shabby little secret. Ben, do you have that paragraph to hand? I, I have the, the highlight, the, the headlines of it. What? I can get it. Yeah, shabby uh, little secret. That is the or whole of their secret. shabby secret, the yeah. secret of all their esoteric philosophies, of all their dialectics and super senses, of their evasive eyes and snarling words, the secret for which they destroy civilization, okay. language, industries, and lives. So pause. Dialectic, that's the Marxist method. Um, I mean, the term dialectic has a long history of meaning different things in philosophy, but clearly it's here it's meaning Hegel and Marx is... Um, what they see as the philosophical method and super senses would be what um, people who claim to have you know some sixth sense that puts them in touch with the divine is. And now, what is the whole secret behind that is behind all these things? The secret for which they pierce their own eyes and eardrums, grind out their senses, blank out their minds. The purpose for which they dissolve the absolutes of reason, logic, matter, existence, reality is to erect upon that plastic fog a single holy absolute. Their wish. Okay. So pause here. So we have two things going on here. The whole of their shabby secret is the reason why they do this, right? And it's to elevate their wishes above everything. But then before we're told what the whole of their shabby secret is, we're told what the mysticism is that motivates this shabby secret. And it's the grinding out this and the doing that. So read that bit again, because this, I think, very nicely corresponds with what Al was saying as what 
Galt takes mysticism to be, and now we're getting what its motive is. The secret for which they pierce their own eyes and eardrums, grind out their senses, blank out their minds, the purpose for which they dissolve all the absolutes of reason, right. logic matters. Reality. Right. So it's some kind of degrading of the senses and reason. And that's what we get from the, the passage that Puja quoted, right? It's the acceptance of allegations without proof against from or apart from the evidence of senses and one's reason. So it's your demoting the senses and reason and putting something above them as one's guide to life and source of knowledge. And if that's, that's rationality, right, is the virtue of granting, of accepting that A is A and that reason is your, a guide, is your tool of knowledge and guide to life. Um, and it's part of accepting that is that any kind of faith or acceptance of something above reason is a kind of short-circuiting of your reason. Mysticism then is, is not just the practice of degrading reason and elevating something above it, but it's the kind of endo endorsement as a, not just you did it today, but you say like, here's how we should be. We should put down reason and put something else above it. And if that's the essence of it, the degrading of reason and the elevating of something else above reason, then it's a primarily a defined negatively. It's the opposition or the anti-rationalism, if you want to put it that way. And then what's the motive of anti-rationalism? And also it consists in, since what reason amounts to is recognizing that the world is what it is, that the existence exists and that things are what they are, Part of elevating something above reason is saying, well, things don't have to be what they are. Maybe things aren't what they are. Not everything is what it is. Maybe wishing does make it so and so forth. And then the whole of the shabby secret of the people that do that is they want to make their wish a holy absolute that's above the law of identity. And then you had some thoughts about where we've seen this before. Yeah, well, I'm reminded of the scene between Dagny and James, uh, page 917 of the Standard Edition. Uh, first, it comes up because he's... He's telling her, why won't you be realistic and accept Cuffy Mix's orders as reality? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you see her reflecting on this uh, and, and coming to many of the same conclusions that Galt later articulates. Uh, there was the ultimate goal of all that loose academic prattle, mm -hmm. which businessmen had ignored for years, the goal of all the slipshod definitions, sloppy generalities, soupy abstractions, all claiming that obedience to objective reality is the same as obedience to the state and to the, to the MIGS made world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later in the passage, it, this is where Jim explains, I want to be president of a railroad, and it's, it's your job to, uh, to stop me from suffering. And there's his wish being erected as a holy absolute, yeah. not to mention Cuffy Meggs's. And, you know, I want it. And so, um, yeah, so there's this wanting your wishes to be gratified without concern for what's possible and therefore um, blanking out questions of what's possible. Um, wanting their feelings to be omnipotent is another way Galt uh, puts it. That might be a, a brief a slight paraphrase. They want to evade the law of identity so that things don't have to be precisely what they are but can be what would be more convenient for you to be what they are. And again we get the idea of they want to reverse the relationship of consciousness and existence. So instead of their consciousness having to grasp out what things are and working to uh, keep their mind in touch with reality, rather reality will bend to their wishes and whims. Um, it's the theory that that will happen, and it's, it's, it's um, promoted, so-called things, by people who want the world to be like that. Another part of the essence of mysticism, though, I think that we ought to talk about, is um, t how fully Galt thinks it's a negative doctrine. And it's a negative doctrine in content. So what it's about is putting down reason, putting down the things that reason can tell you about, namely the world and the objects of the senses, and putting down uh, and devaluing the things that can be achieved rationally. Um, so it's a negative, it's about to hell with the senses, to hell with this world, to hell with uh, what you think you know and what you think you can accomplish, um, rather than about the things that it offers as ideals instead. Um, and that's what's supposed to be in common, I think, to um, Marxism, to religion, to uh, all kinds of different theories. 
if you thought there were many different things that somebody might pursue, a utopian future uh, where um, uh, a utopian socialist future, a life in heaven where you stored up treasures. Um, a life on earth where you are producing treasures, and these are just all different things someone might pursue. Maybe they're not all actually achievable, but they're all goals someone could have. Um, then you would not think that um, the two other than um, uh, achieving uh, happiness and success on earth are really variants of the same thing. But what Galt seems to think is that these other ideals don't really have content. Um, and they're not really, it's not just that they in fact can't be achieved, they're not even held as things to try to achieve, but as idols to which to sacrifice, and that they're somehow about being rationalizations for destruction or putting down reason, rather than being um, things thought in their own right or for their own this sake. This is something I had a question about. Mm -hmm. Because I could, I can see there are, there are probably people out there who are wondering, well, all right, I mean, there's such a thing as, as using an ideology to rationalize some uh -huh. psychopathology of yours. Mm -hmm. But surely these critics would say uh, there could be people who are led to these beliefs through honest consideration of the issues and the ideas and, the, and even arguments. And so, why is she being so dismissive? Why is she, why is she sweeping with such a broad brush here? And and she literally does sweep aside those sweep those aside hatred, those hatred mystics, mystics. Yeah. right? And she does say it when you so talking to the audience of the speech, or Galt does say when you talking to the audience of the speech, not specifically to these mystics, right? When you accept any part of their creed, it's because of such and such. Sam will talk about what it is later but it's not flattering. So it's, Galt's view seems to be that this whole constellation of ideas is inherently dishonest. Yeah, it does. And, and motivated by dishonest things. He even says there's no such thing as an honest revolt against reason. When you, right. And when now, you honest reason. revolt against reason, okay, I think most people, or not most people, that's easier to accept than there's no such thing as honestly accepting any part of a creed right. that you, Galt, have identified as being a revolt against reason. Maybe someone's not revolting against reason, they just think, you know, uh, the minimum wage is good. Um, so, uh, yeah, Alex? Um, I have a metaphor for mysticism and ration irrationality. So when a person is riding a bike, they need to pedal, they need to be aware of the environment around them, they need to look at the, ride, the road that they're riding on. And one cannot, for a couple seconds, even close their eyes or fall asleep or read a book, no matter how much they must wish. And that's against the nature of riding a bike, and one is doomed to fall and crash. So this is um, why, if mis this is, I guess the critics would wonder why are you saying that when we come to these views, we necessarily have our eyes closed. Yeah, why, so what, why you're, what you're giving is a metaphor for irrationality sure. and why irrationality is wrong. And I think someone who accepts that something is irrational, um, there are two, you can imagine two types of people disagreeing. One who says, yeah, it's irrational and I'm down with it. I like irrationality. We ought to have a little irrationality in our life. Uh, and there are and, very few people who say well, that. Well, I think there are people who say that, there, actually. There are few. Um, reason isn't everything, and you can't always go by reason. I think there's a non-trivial number of people who would actually say that type of thing. Um, and there are many people in, in, in the book who would say that type of thing. So, okay, it, it's easy to see why Galt would say, yeah, that's just not an honest position. That's a position that's born out of vice and so forth. Um, what about someone who says, no, look, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I agree with you. If something's irrational, I'm not going to accept it. But, um, you know... I've read somebody who's talked with angels to take, uh, assume Will was talking about, right? And I'm perfectly rational about it. I think he was perfectly rational about it. And, and here's why ask, I believe in angels. People ask this about Kant all the time, especially mm -hmm. given that she thought so poorly of him. I mean, he's a smart guy, gives lots of arguments, and he talks about the importance of reason even all the time. So, so maybe he's not. So if, if the doctrine is a revolt against reason, it's easier to see why, um, 
why she thinks, or Galt thinks, there's no honest revolt against reason, uh, particularly given what honesty is, which is accepting that, you know, uh, reason is the faculty that can tell what's real and that's interested in determining whether things are real, and honesty is about rejecting unreality. Um, the question is, is it tr what things count as part of the mystic's creed? And is it true that um, accepting any part of the mystic's creed always comes from some motive of vice in some way or another? And that's not a kind of thing that I think one could answer quickly and easily or prove just from some lines in a book. I mean, in, in the novel, we're shown how that's behind various people's motivations as their motivations unfold. If it's something that's true, or if it's something that's false, for that matter, it's something that you would have to see over the course of a life by interacting with uh, people who hold different views and by interrogating those views in yourself and thinking, you know, where, what's drawing me towards this? If you find that something's an error that you made, uh, was it really an honest error all the way? Are there things that you're afraid to look at or think about? And, and is that, um, you know, and in general, there's a question of how you can tell if these claims about motivation are true, for any claims about motivation. And we're given a certain kind of evidence within the world of the novel. Within our world, we need to look at the actual people. Carrie Ann? You know, I think you're absolutely right that in any given case, you need to, you know, probe the person who's questioning to understand why they're holding the beliefs that they do, and maybe there was an honest error at some point, uh, and what premises are involved in that. But I think more broadly, she must have been taking a swipe at the uh, general unreflective conventionalism of a lot of people, mm -hmm. that uh, certain ideas sound good because they're kind of like a moral package deal. Good people do X, Y, and Z. And they they didn't think to ask, well, are those good? You know, how do I know that? They're relying on other people telling them that that's the case. So I think that's probably the target she has in mind, and and that many people do fall into that conventionalism. They get wrapped up in the everyday stuff of life, and and don't ask these questions about really fundamental uh, standards that they should. So one important thing is that the this section is about the teachers mm -hmm. of this mystical doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. These are people who've made some kind of uh, living out of spreading these ideas mm -hmm. and who had the time to digest them and accept them anyway. Yeah, and But she, not everybody in the world who's taken a class from one of these teachers or read a book mm -hmm. or an article by one of them who has swallowed one of these ideas temporarily has, has ne necessarily done all the thinking. They don't necessarily know what, what it is they're <laughs> swallowing. I mean, she definitely has a very negative view of the people who she views as preachers or teachers of mysticism, and definitely has a different view of them than she has, and Galt does, of a typical person who may have imbibed quite a lot of this and might live by quite a lot of it. Galt is speaking primarily to the latter sort of people and damning the, the former sort of people, which is why they're in the third person, your teachers. Um, on the other hand, he does seem to think that um, it's people's fault and through some kind of default or vice on their part, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later as we look at the passages, that people accept these kind of ideas. Why didn't you listen to your teacher a little more critically? Um, yeah, and, and there are particular reasons why she thinks people go for this. I mean, I've come to think that intellectual honesty is extremely rare, consistent intellectual honesty. And that there are some topics about which, you know, one in a few thousand people is probably intellectually honest. I think most people's, almost everybody's views about politics are mostly dishonest. Most people have views, they don't really think very much about the issues, they don't have, uh, they don't really know much about the facts, and they don't really care to know. It's mostly about true, posturing. If that were true about people's views about politics, it would be, we would be have a political disaster. <laughs> well, it's not just a present tense one. We've had, you know, decades and decades of political disaster, right? And maybe since, um, and I think likewise about religion. I think people are. It's much easier to be rational and honest about your day-to-day -day concerns, uh, and like doing your job well and so forth. And most people, I think, are reasonably honest about those kinds of things, but I think are not reasonably honest about. Um, the kinds of topics that are covered in philosophy. I mean, even look at Reardon, who's unusually mm -hmm. honest and mm -hmm. who's just swallowed a little bit uh -huh. of 
this mind-body dichotomy and the effects that it's had on his life because of that. And Reardon thinks, you know, it's not like he beats himself up over this terribly, right? And I don't think anyone should, but Reardon doesn't, Reardon thinks his mistakes were some of them somewhat dishonest, right? And takes some responsibility for them. Now, exactly what the moral culpability for all these things are is, is worth our thinking more about. Because it's not clear that Reardon was being irrational exactly, but I don't know. I mean, it's worth thinking about. Reardon says he was faking reality, right? And uh, Al? I think um, one can be mistaken about how one knows what is good and bad without endorsing mysticism. Yeah. I've met many people who say, well, if you see someone torturing a puppy or a baby, mm -hmm. you just know mm -hmm. that's bad. I don't think they're espousing <laughs> mysticism. They are, uh, I think, not appreciating that they had to learn many things to, uh, to have that reaction. Yeah, I think when, when Ren talks about any form of just knowing as type of mysticism, um, there's a type of just knowing, like it doesn't take very much time to know, or I can tell. Um, you know, automatized knowledge. Automat what you would call automatized knowledge, yeah. That is not what's supposed to be meant there by just knowing. It's some kind of knowing that there's no account possible of how this knowledge comes to be and no way to justify or back it up or figure out if it's really knowledge. And damn it, why do you keep asking? I can just tell. You know, like that kind of just But sometimes that's... people confuse the phenomenon that Al's talking about, the automatized knowledge that they have built up and that they have reason to think is knowledge uh -huh. with the yeah. claims to mystical insight that other people say they have. And then that... And not only do some people think confuse it's it, it's, 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 it's there are really difficult questions, as you know, we've both written on, about the... Um, difficulty of figuring out how certain types of knowledge that are accessible even to fairly children and fairly unsophisticated people work. So it's not, math you know, is a really good example. math or just, you know, I mean, when you look at someone and can see that they're tired or bored or whatever, you know, what is it about them that you can tell that they're tired or bored or whatever? And could you be tricked by a good actor? It's very hard to, well, it's that his eye did that droop or whatever. You can't really spell it out. It just looks tired or bored to you. And how do you account for those abilities to notice and diagnose things and so forth. Um, these are, you know, difficult problems within epistemology to spell out all the answers to them. And, you know, you can go get a book on um, books. Well, there aren't that many good books on the subject, but you can, um, I can recommend some if people want books on epistemology. Um, okay, so let's um, move on a little bit to what, leave the question open that there's just whether these psychological theories are true um, and who they're true of and how many people of what sort are a kind of thing, I think in general, views of what drive people are something that you have to absorb a few of them you know, from books and from different people who have theories about this kind of thing and sit with them for some time and think about the people you meet and encounter and yourself and see which ones help you to make sense of them. Uh, to be in a position to judge them. It's not something that you can, uh, and then, then with that kind of in mind, you can um, figure out which one there's the most evidence for. And we can see in a way that that's what Daphne's doing, right? Um, she heard some of these views, these people don't really value their own lives from Galt and Axton, but it's not like they tried to give her a whole bunch of arguments for them, or they tried to say, you'll just understand, and for those who understand, no explanation is necessary, but for those who don't, none is possible. I, with you, you'll have to go back and check. Do some experiments with people. See how they react when this happens. Uh, see if this uh, way of viewing it makes sense of them. And when you start acting um, on testing your assumption that they do ultimately want to value their lives, uh, see, see what happens. And I think one has to go out into the world with the ideas one gets from this novel or from any other novel or uh, philosophical treatise on motivation and, you know, see what one could tell from interacting with people and, and trying to put them under these concepts. In any case, Galt um, thinks the mystic's desire to escape the absolutism of reality um, and to erect their whims uh, as a wholly absolute that's absolute, whereas reality isn't, amounts to a hatred of existence as such. And I think that's uh, really important. They're driven to destroy, and 
in particular, deep down, what they want, they're, they're driven to destroy themselves. Uh, Galt puts it, the desire, that they don't want anything to be anything in particular, which means they don't want anything to be, because to be is to be something in particular. And they, importantly, themselves don't want to be anything in particular. And we can see that in Jim Taggart. Um, we can see that in Jim Taggart, who, as he's walking home on uh, the night that the um, decision was made to nationalize Nikonia Copper, this all this wheeling and dealing happened, right? He is trying to escape the question, what am I? He doesn't want his life to have added up to anything, but it seems to have. And he, he, the thing he's really trying to evade and push out of his mind is he doesn't want to be anything in particular. And then, Ben, you pointed to Cheryl's later thoughts about, about him in this connection. Yeah, he, this is what he she says, because the, the topic of Hank Reardon has come up, and then you, the welfare preachers, it's the spirit that you want to loot. It's the spirit that you want to loot. I never thought and nobody ever told us how it could could be thought of and what it would mean, the unearned in spirit, but that's what you want. You want unearned love, you want unearned admiration, you want unearned greatness. You want to be a man like Hank Reardon without the necessity of being what he is, without the necessity of being. Yeah. And it, that also reminds me of an earlier passage with, with James. If you remember the scene right after the tunnel disaster, and he's just sitting in his office and stewing in, in, uh, in trying to not identify the causes, not identify the reality of the situation, mm -hmm. not to think about it at all. And at a certain point, you get this, this hatred that's, that's um, piling up inside him uh, described. And he doesn't want to identify what the object of the hatred is. The ball was hatred. Hatred is his only answer. Hatred is sole reality. Hatred without object, cause, beginning or end. Hatred is the claim against the universe, etc. And eventually he lashes out at Dagny. Uh -huh. uh, and certainly he does, he does hate her too. But you have to wonder, reading back, looking at this scene again, is, 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 is he also hating himself? Because and hating existence. Yeah. If it's I mean, a hatred without object means it's an all-consuming kind of metaphysical hatred, a hatred of and this is, of course, after the disaster that he is partially responsible for has just happened. So, and he knows that. So there's this idea of the mystics as haters of reality, as wanting to destroy, and in particular wanting to destroy themselves, not in the sense that they directly want to be dead, but that they want something, the only realization of which is death and in that they want to get away from every aspect of what they specifically are. But to get away from everything that you specifically are is to be nothing. Because if you want to, you know, be stronger in your weak or thinner in your fat or taller in your short, you know, there's some specific other thing you want to be, and you can be aiming towards that, smarter when you're dumb or whatever. But if you just, whatever feature of you, you want, the op you want to not have it, and there's no other particular thing you want instead of it, your motivation is everything about you you don't like, and there's nothing instead of it that you like. You might not hold it as, um, I hate myself and want to die, but the only thing that would satisfy your desire to get rid of every attribute you have is death. And Galt's take on the mystic seems to be that that is actually their motivational set. That is actually how the motivation of a Jim or a Lillian works, although they have a need to hide that from themselves. And I think that explains what was happening to Lillian in that last scene with her, right, where she was coming undone. Well, you, you just said that they might not hold it that way, mm -hmm. but isn't it, isn't it a stronger point than that? Because, and for reasons that we're going to get to later when we get to the self-esteem mm -hmm. section, they can't hold it that way. How right. could they? Uh, and, and go on living. Uh, and, you know, in anything other than a st the state of a comatose person. I mean, there's a question of in what sense can they go on, but somehow their ability to function as they have been, so the thesis seems to be, is broken if they see that all the way to the bottom. And you get the sense that Lillian is somehow broken and won't be the same after that last scene with her and Reardon. Um, and we'll see if we if any. Harry of the other in the chat case. makes an interesting point uh, that the, we had asked this question about whether Dagny was helpful to Cheryl in that final scene, mm -hmm. and whether, and he suggests perhaps the answer was 
no, because Dagny couldn't grasp the role of the death principle here, yeah. whereas Cheryl seeing it more than Dagny did. Oh, yeah, I think that's exactly what the problem is there. Dagny doesn't understand evil. What's interesting is that she thinks she does. Right? And so she's telling Cheryl, when you grasp what they are, you know, don't let it hurt you too much and don't let it, it can't change things. And in a certain sense, that's true. But Daphne doesn't know what or understand it and can't say what they are and why uh, it, you shouldn't, uh, and why you can go on despite, and how you can go on despite the fact that people are like this. Because you have to go on very differently. Uh, Daphne's got no answer, and she is another victim. And that's why when Cheryl thinks of her, she, doesn't, she just doesn't have an answer. And the way in which she's allowing herself to be a victim, I think, connects to the, one of the next topic we want to discuss, what it is that the mystics are trying to get out of their victims. Yeah, I mean, there's... The, so the other side of this hating existence and wanting to erect a plastic fog and then they erect their wish as a holy absolute is somehow this is connected to their wanting power over others. Right, and there's wanting power for Daphne in particular, but this in general wanting power over others. And this is the other kind of side of the description of the mystics. And there's this really interesting psychology of a mystic, passages on the psychology of mystic, which incidentally, Rem was writing notes on psychology um, to herself around the time she was writing Galt's speech, some of which, not all of them, have been published in... Uh, the journals of Ayn Rand, edited by Dave Harriman, uh, as notes while writing Galt's speech, I think. Um, and she's trying to develop a, a psychological theory. And you can see just a lot of overlap, even from the published versions, and there's more in the non-published, to what's going on in this speech. That there are certain basic alternatives that a consciousness faces uh, early in life, and uh, what side you take of those alternatives subconsciously uh, in the choices you make early on kind of drives a lot of your conscious conviction, uh, drives a lot of your perspective on the world later. Then later on as adults you form self-conscious articulate um, principles with respect to these issues which may be consistent or may be inconsistent with the kind of childhood orientations you develop towards them. And then there are questions as to how you can, and what she's writing about in these notes is how is it possible to change maybe your early um, premises if you later as an adult come to think they're wrong and what are the different effects of different constellations of premises but one of them is um, do you place other people above reality or reality above other people um, your judgment of reality do you judge reality for yourself and how it is or do you treat other people as what's primarily determinative um, and this is what we see in this the birth of a mystic Somewhere back in the recesses of his childhood, between it is and they say, he chose they say. He put other people above himself out of so craven a fear of independence. And pretty close. Um, he developed, thanks. What's the, you want to read the actual quote if you found it? You, you, you got it close enough. Okay. So out of so craven a fear of independence, he put other people above himself. And he's created a mindset where other people and their consciousness seems to him to be all-powerful. And so when the mystic thinks he's in touch with or some all-powerful being, uh, it's, uh, it's, him, it's the consciousnesses of others, the people who he's trying to manipulate, that, uh, that he's actually responding to. And if you are awed by him, you're kind of awed by his being awed by you and the other people who he's... It's, it's interesting how this is a special twist on that old idea that uh, man creates God in his image, uh -huh. uh, which may have come from one of those uh, 19th century materialists like Feuerbach, perhaps. But but you, when you when you hear that idea, usually it's it's much more optimistic sounding. Like we we think well of ourselves. We think of ourselves as being powerful, and uh -huh. so we project a God in the sky who's got even more more of that kind of power. But this is. This is like the negative spin on that, where uh, your it's not necessarily your your own consciousness, but the consciousness of another person uh, that you surrender to, and therefore see as ruling the universe somehow. Maybe, yeah. Um, I'll think about that. But what we see in Galt is this is this idea that 
belief in supernatural powers, supernatural consciousnesses, is a kind of fear of other people, and particularly the fear of the other people that you're trying to manipulate by it, that, that the people who claim this are trying to manipulate by it. Um, and that it is a kind of means of manipulation. And that's, you know, again, an interesting theory. Uh, yeah, Anna. So this reminds me of two other areas of Ayn Rand's fiction writing. One was in Anthem, where uh, nobody's allowed to have thoughts of their own, and they can't voice what they think for fear that it differs from what everybody else thinks. Yeah. And then the other one was Peter Keating in the Fountainhead with mirrors going off in infinite direction, yeah. <laughs> or, or infinitely back and forth, where... where so both of those are, are passages that deal with the issue of, uh, of independence and dependence, people who are not being independent. And I think what we're get, getting the premise here is that mysticism comes in one way or another, both the mysticism of the mystics, but also the buying into the mysticism by other people, is caused through some kind of fear of independence. Uh, there's a lot else on this we want to say, so I want to kind of start moving a little bit more quickly. Uh, I want to talk about uh, why it is that people are vulnerable to mysticism, uh, thinks Galt. But there's one other topic we have to hit really before that, and this is threatening to transition us to that, which is this passage about the, the birth of a thinker. And Ben, do you want to pull up that passage? So this connects to what the goal of the mystic doctrines are. And she thinks that they're trying to, what they're aimed at is undoing um, concepts that are central to our ability to think. Uh, and the, the central one is objective reality. But read us the passage. So there's a long this. paragraph. Do you want me to focus on one part of it? Um, I read starting the whole paragraph with, off. It's a really starting with what one. a savage is? Yeah. So savage, and this, we had a question about this in the earlier discussion, is a being who has not grasped that A is A and that reality is real. He has arrested his mind at the level of a baby's at the stage when a consciousness requires its initially sensory perceptions, its initial sensory perceptions, and has not learned to distinguish solid objects. It's to a baby that the world appears as a blur of motion without things that move. And the birth of his mind is the day when he grasps that the streak that keeps flickering past him in his mother and the world beyond her is a curtain that the two are solid entities and that neither can turn into the other, that they are what they are, that they exist. The day when he grasps that matter has no volition is the day when he grasps that he has, and this is his birth as a, as a human being. Uh, and... To the thinker-scientist bit comes a little bit later, right? Yeah, I'll just keep going. The, the day when he grasps that the reflection he sees in a mirror is not a delusion, that it is real, but it is not himself, that the mirage he sees in a desert is not a delusion, that the air and the light rays that cause it are real, but it is not a city, it is a city's reflection. The day when he grasps that he is not a passive recipient of the sensations of any given moment, that his senses do not provide him with automatic knowledge in separate snatches independent of context, but only with the material of knowledge, which his mind must learn to integrate. The day when he grasps that his senses cannot deceive him, that physical objects cannot act without causes, that his organs of perception are physical and have no volition, no power to invent or to distort, that the evidence that they give him is an absolute, but his mind must learn to understand it. His mind must discover the nature that causes the full context of his sensory material. His mind must identify the things that he perceives. That is the day of his birth as a thinker and a scientist. I have a few thoughts on that myself, but I want to hear yours first. Yes, yeah, so what's going on here, right, is there's this day when it's just your birth as a thinker and a scientist, which is your distinguishing of your mind from reality. There's the world and there's your mind, and choice belongs to the mind, and volition belongs to the mind, and making decisions and acting for motives belongs to the mind. And the world acts in certain determinate ways by definite laws that, uh, rather than by choice, desires, etc. And it's making that distinction and then having made that distinction and deciding to use your mind to grasp how the world works so that you can then act in the world and achieve what you want out of it. Uh, maintaining this firm mind-world distinction rather than blurring them together is an achievement, and it's the achievement that separates as... Galt thinks of it a thinker from a savage, and fully a scientist is a kind of fully developed type of thinker. 
that's the concept that Galt and Rand call objective reality. And what she sees mysticism as is an attack on that concept, a trying to blur back together consciousness and the world. Um, like people, very primitive peoples, uh, had them blurred together because they hadn't grasped this yet. And so they thought there were, everything was magic and so forth. And it's not, you know, their fault. They just, you know, it takes work and time to recognize this and to achieve um, in an individual's life or in cultures, uh, to achieve this kind of fully human stature and realization and learn how to think. Uh, mysticism and the program of the mystics, so the idea goes, is a doctrine that's trying to undo this, to take us to a pre-human level, uh, on a level that if implemented fully consistently would even be pre-language, things called. Um, thoughts on this? You have Ben, you with time, I don't know if other people... Why don't you say what you were going to and then let's... Yeah, well, just that... So one thing that pops out of this passage to me is, is the day when he grasped that his senses cannot deceive him, that objects can't act without causes, his organs are physical and have no volition. Um, so it's not just a point here about reality out there doesn't have a choice, uh -huh. and I do. It's that even inside me, there are things that have no choice, that uh -huh. are metaphysically given, such as my senses, uh, versus my judgment, which makes a choice. Mm -hmm. And you know, having thought about this some in epistemology and academic epistemology, you know, of course, that there's that most philosophers to this day still think that the senses make errors of one form or another, even the mm -hmm. ones who don't think of themselves as skeptics. Right. Uh, and interestingly, the all many of the arguments that they give for that involve this idea of well, there's a way that the senses really should work mm -hmm. if they were giving reality to us yeah. directly. Uh, they wouldn't have. Uh, they wouldn't have a nature, they wouldn't have, we'd really like to be able to get things spoon-fed to us. But the unfortunately, they're getting they them in automatic snatches, right, without right. context. Unfortunately, they're not that way, and so they make mistakes, even if we can figure out ways to work around them. And these are the kind, I mean, this is the kind of thing that she has a really high bar on ideas being non-mystical, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it, 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 uh, pe there are people who I think are trying to get the senses right, um, and aren't motivated by a desire to destroy reality that uh, don't have exactly the right view of perception. Um, I think whether they count as mystical or not counts is really going to depend on, I think, Galt even would agree, on what the motivation for this and, and what draws them to this view and what are they trying to do with this and defend. And there's a difference between but, being a mystic and, mm -hmm. and accepting a mystical idea unwittingly. Yeah, although again, Galt, Galt thinks any part of their creed, if you accept it. Now, maybe something hyper-technical would not count as part of their creed, but um, you can't know the world. Or something. But that's, um, on these issues of the senses, there's a, a lot of really interesting questions in philosophy. Of ben and I are both in a book called Concepts on the, and Their Role in Knowledge, uh, edited by Gotthelf and Lennox, that has, uh, and the part that Ben and I are both in, or one of them is a long exchange on perception that's on very much on this issue of can the senses deceive you uh, in, in what sense what are we to make of the various kinds of errors that are sometimes attributed to the senses and if you remember one of the people in that exchange even started talking about the original sin of the senses mm -hmm. uh, I can't yeah. remember how that came up in, the, in that connection but I remember you flagging it and saying this is really a significant revelation they thought they were maybe just using it as a kind of metaphor for something right I remember us having to talk about that um, and, and Ben's last piece in this exchange, I think, nicely brings out the ways in which there's a kind of supernaturalistic view, uh, even in views of the senses that seem very much not to have that. Um, so what's, what's that? Keeping up appearances, I think, maybe yeah. was the title of your piece. So uh, there's a good recommendation uh, for, for something by Ben. Um, okay, so I think that's as much as we should say about the, the savages and the objective reality issue. Um, I, I want to flag one other point connected to it, and then I want to go to why people are vulnerable to, to the mystics. Um, mysticism, she thinks, and non-rational ways of thinking are parasitical on the way that the thinker and scientist and the strikers function. Uh, and this way of functioning in anyone to a smaller degree. I mean, the scientists and, and the strikers are the people who are consistently this way. But what Galt says about the audience is, you are the people who choose to reach that part of the time, right? Who choose part way or part of the time to reach that day that's the birth of your day. So it's, it's 
there's this mode of functioning, which is the fully human, rational mode of functioning, and all the mystical stuff is parasitical on that, wherever it can find it. it. Maybe it finds a John Galt, who's consistently that way, and it tries to parasitize him. Maybe it finds a Robert Stadler, who's that way some of the time in some aspects of his life, and feeds off, uh, and feeds off of that strength. Uh, maybe it finds a Hank Reardon. Maybe it finds a Cheryl Brooks. Maybe it finds a, But wherever it can find... Uh, or a wet nurse, whoever can find any part of anyone functioning in this way, that's the good, that's the pro-human, and that's what the mystical, anti-rational is parasitical on. And it's just want to mention the range of ways in which Galt thinks it's parasitical on it. Because, okay, the obvious one is you need to be rational and good and productive to produce wealth, and uh, people would die if they didn't have food, and, and so it's parasitical on the wealth. But it's also para the bad characters and the bad in characters is also parasitical on the good in other less obvious ways. First, it's parasitical in motive. So without us, the men of the mind, you and the mystics, you know, says Gaul, wouldn't even know what to want. You wouldn't want money if we hadn't made money. You wouldn't want, you know, washing machines to wash your clothes if we hadn't created them. You wouldn't want um, uh, self-esteem if there weren't some of us who had achieved self-esteem and shown you what it was like to be proud and, and like yourself and then you realize that's possible and you want that. Every desire you have is a desire, there aren't automatic desires. And it's um, the desires that people, the characters like Jim Taggart are going around aping like sexual desire and the desire for luxuries are all, even those motives uh, are somehow come from the type of life in which that kind of motivation is possible. So the motives are somehow stolen or parasitical from the motives of the good people and the good in people, motives that come out of this thinking way of life. And then the concepts and language. So the whole possibility of language and thinking in terms of words, um, which is what human thinking is, comes out of this mode of thinking that comes from recognizing the difference between yourself and the world outside of yourself, recognizing that you have control and the world, that you can make choices and phys mere physical objects cannot make choices, that it's your mind, that part of you that's able to make choices, not your perception, and then thinking about how to organize things, what to call them, um, that's something that's man-made but needs to be made a certain way in order to grasp the way the world is, that's that fact of making things as a human being volitionally and by your reason, but doing it in the way you need to do it to get at reality and to interact with reality is uh, what Rand in later writings calls objectivity. And concepts, words, our way of thinking is objective. And the mystics steal concepts like they steal wealth. And this is an idea that Rand develops in uh, her later writing about concepts uh, in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology and elsewhere. Um, there's a good kind of, well, there's a lot of great material on this in, in uh, Objectivism in the Philosophy of Ayn Rand in the section on objectivity. Uh, that's chapter six, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And there's, um, uh, I discussed this a fair amount in a companion to Ayn Rand in chapter 11, um, the idea of objectivity and stolen concepts. Okay, but now let's switch to, away from these kind of uh, metaphysical and epistemic topics, to the question of why it is that people are vulnerable to mystics. They um, carry on? Mm -hmm. I actually think it's connected to the next question you had put out there for this week's discussion mm -hmm. about self-esteem. Uh, okay. That if people will be susceptible to relying on others telling them that something is the case, if they don't feel confident in their own abilities to think. And uh -huh. I mean, even among people who you think might be generally intelligent, like uh, a lot of my, I've been teaching for 24 years, I'm shocked at how many countless numbers of students have said things like, you know, uh, who am I to know, um, you know, how can I, you know, think my own thoughts about this, you're asking me to evaluate, I have no idea, um, I don't think logically, I don't know if I could do this, and I'm really staggered by the fact that so many people lack that confidence in their abilities to trust themselves that they have good minds. That the other pe I, and here's a question I actually have in relation to this. I've found it very puzzling. I could see if people have been hounded by other folks saying, oh, you know, I'm going to tell you, you should do it because I said so. 
uh, you don't you you're not able to think but my question is on the other side like why would why would somebody believe that uh -huh. I, I don't know that they were able to think <laughs> exactly just because other people told them not to or they're badgering them and not say well well, well why you know I'm looking at the world I see it's not the way you say it is and and I'm just going to try it myself so there's a there's a little bit of a puzzle there I think in terms of why they never pushed back in the first place if they've been uh, repeatedly told that they are not able to think and they should trust other people. Uh, Anna? Training when you're very, very young could have a lot to do with it. Um, you know, I, I personally was pretty lucky. I mean, um, just based on how I was handled and taught and treated from age, you know, zero on up. But some people are in a very different environment, and when you ask them these questions, they 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 don't have any experience at pushing back, as as you said. They don't have never had the micro steps that it might take for them then to handle these bigger problems. That that's my guess because if you take a kid and you and you and you, and you teach them very logically when they're very young and you give them. Problem solves, um, problems to solve, and you, you challenge them. You're the adult, and, and they're maybe two or three five years old. They develop in micro steps what it takes. And they experience this this um, resistance and them resisting and re pushing back and them pushing back on these questions. That then they learn how to answer in more detail. But if they've never experienced that on any level, then then it's like they've come across a rock and they have no lever. They don't have any tool whatsoever and all they can feel is there's this rock and you're asking me to push it or hold it up and I, I can't do it. How, you have to start with the very basic things and sometimes teach them how to, how to learn that they have the mind and how to get started with it. That's, that's the only answer. Alex? And I wanted to add to what Anna said by noting that a lot of parents take t the idea of teaching their children as a kind of duty and they just tell them because I said so. They don't explain their motivations and they don't explain why things are the way they are and the child never learns to conceptualize in that way. Okay. Well, I, I guess this is where I mean, every human being, unless they're seriously incapacitated, has the ability always <coughs> to use their eyes. Somebody tells them something's red and they look and see that it's green and say, no, that's not the case. And just to step, they can always choose to do otherwise at any point in their lives. So regardless of how hostile the environment, there are certainly some people who grew up in hostile environments who uh, always chose to uh, resist and to be independent. So. Uh, this kind of like social conditioning stuff may be somewhat explanatory for many people, but it's not determinative. Not, not social so conditioning, education is not well, the same. Well, it's a social similar thing. thing. Education. Whether, no, 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 very <laughs> different. I, what I was talking about when I was growing up was not social conditioning by my parents. It was education, specific facts that you're taught. Well, but whatever you want to call it, yeah. there's the other people who are around you and what they do to you in, to help or harm you. And or to try to help you, but maybe it doesn't, and that would include your education, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, are definitely mm -hmm. ways of educating people that make it easier for them to develop the kind of intellectual autonomy that Galt thinks people need. And there are ways of educating people that fail to give them the help they need. Mm -hmm. And Galt thinks, and Rand certainly thought, there are ways of educating them that not only fail to give them the help they need, but actively sabotage them. Think of what Reardon thinks about Tony's teachers. Um, and yet, I think there's still, at least from Galt and Rand's perspective, something very much to what Carrie Ann is saying, that, okay, so the help or hindrance your parents and teachers and others give you can make it a lot easier or a lot harder to develop. And yet, there are people who develop into independent thinkers in the very worst of circumstances, yeah. and people who fail to in the very best. There's a few people in the chat who are commenting on this. Uh, uh -huh. Al, Al in the chat is saying, people don't want the, even so, people don't want the responsibility of thinking uh, mm -hmm. and the consequences that go along with that. And Puja says, many people embrace mystical beliefs because the facts of reality can be hard to take some time, uh, to take sometimes, and they want the solace that comes from false hope. I mean, And part of the hardness is the 
the it's not just oh that fact sucks I don't want to believe it but it's it, it accepting the nature of yourself and the universe puts a lot of responsibility on you to make something of your life and so it's not just hard in the sense of hard to take it's hard in the sense of assuming a burden um, and, a burden might be the wrong one, but a, a, assuming a task and this is rather the, than just not this is one of the places where I've often thought the existentialists might be on to something because mm -hmm. they have this idea that there's a kind of nausea that comes from from freedom from freedom yeah. from the realizing that you're the one who's responsible for your life and mm. that now they think that that nausea is is kind of built into your metaphysical nature that any human being is going to experience it but uh, it may well be that they're they're they've got their finger on something you know it's going to look like nausea to somebody who doesn't want that responsibility but somebody who's got a different attitude may have a different feeling about it yeah the the, the, the a vast responsibility that you're not used to and uh, could be maybe induce that. Robert? Yeah, in hearing the back and forth between Carrie and Anne, I want to tell my own story, which is I'm number eight out of nine kids in a big Catholic family. God was never open to question my entire time growing up until I was 18, and I read early in the Fountainhead, Howard Rourke said he doesn't believe in God, and I shut the book saying, wow, I have to think about this because I related to Rock in so many ways. And it took until reading John Gold's speech, like I struggled with it, reading the whole of Fountainhead, and then I was shrugged when Gold says, uh, faith in the supernatural begins with faith in the superiority of others. Uh -huh. I closed the book, I said, nobody's superior to me, that's it, I'm done with God. But I also had to make sure I had moved out of my house because I didn't want to, <laughs> seriously, I didn't want, you know, repercussions uh, from that. And there was a little bit of pushback, but it wasn't, it, you know, they, sadly, my family thinks my God is on brand. So, because they just can't conceive of there not being a God, but it's just I had a similar experience and hadn't fully Earl, moved out of my did house. Did you want to come in on this? Well, I was going to say sometimes uh, the environment affects the answers, like when Ben was talking about seizing, I think there's a real difference between stolen valor seize, uh, seeming and Machiavelli seeming. It's better to seem than to be. And when you're in a position like, let's say, you're a student in college, whatever you think of that, you're not going to put it forward in case that kind of thinking differs from the kind of thinking of the professor who wants a certain answer that will determine what kind of grade that person gets, which will determine if they get or get not the, the sheepskin. I don't know. Which I wrote way. all kinds of things my professors <laughs> hated in college. Ben and I were talking about this, this the other day. The and one indicting your high school professor. Yeah, I mean, I used to, I, was, I, I wrote like essays to submit to teachers about how evil I thought they were. <laughs> and I did that all through. Now, in, in some cases that I now think were inappropriate, I'm not endorsing them. But, uh, and I usually did pretty well on them. So um, I think students tend to be very afraid of getting uh, bad grades if they disagree with professors. And I'm sure there are teachers and professors who would mark them down for it. But uh, I think it's, it's fairly uncommon. I don't know, Carrie Ann, you're no, in the same I think business. It's deeper than that because some of them, some of them genuinely are afraid of getting bad grades. They, you know, they said their parents will you know, kill them if they don't get good grades or et cetera. But I think a lot of them, it's just the fear of thinking on mm -hmm. their own and, and thinking that they're equipped to wrestle with these on their own terms. They just dash to look at some other people's commentaries instead of grappling with the primary text, which is what I demand that, that they do. And it's like, well, this is, you, you can't grasp it through somebody else's eyes. And they don't get that in a fundamental way. And it's not, necess it's not usually about the grade. It's something much deeper. On this issue of, uh, of teachers and motivations on both sides, there was a, a really nice panel on free speech uh, moderated by Dave Rubin with Ankar Gatte and Jordan Peterson on it. Uh, took place at Clemson University, and there's a discussion on it of just this issue of kind of censoring yourself, not because you're afraid of some physical reprisal, or maybe you'll get shot, um, but or arrested or something, but that because, though that happens, and Ankar pointed out, he was saying, there's that, but the thing you really have to worry about is 
when you're censoring yourself because you think people will disapprove of you or look down on you. And uh, in that context, the idea of, well, what about a professor who will grade you down comes up. And I think both of them have really interesting things to say about that, as does Dave Rubin, which I agree with. And I wonder professors are afraid of not getting tenure. Yeah. Professors are afraid of a lot of things. They're not a model of, of valor. <laughs> Um, I want to move on, though, actually. I, I, I feel oh, okay. like I think I should clarify something, because I don't think that my position that was stated earlier should be at all taken as a social conditioning, anti-individualistic condition. I absolutely oh, I did not mean it that I way. I wasn't taking it that way. I was trying way. to end. Okay, you didn't. Okay, well, uh, just based on what people said after that, <laughs> I, I wanted to clarify. I think you were I pointing out a... why some people or many people find it difficult to answer I think you were pointing out a, a, a real fact about g the growth of a mind, which is that it can be impacted for the positive or negative by the community that we're in. And um, if we just thought, you know, it's all what the individual does, and it doesn't matter where the hell he grows up or what happens to him, we'd really be missing out on an important fact about it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we thought that it was all... Um, all free will and it didn't matter where you were, everybody would come out exactly like they would no matter. Uh, we'd also be missing out an important fact. And I think you and Kerry M were speaking up for different sides of this complex, of this causal complex. Um, not either of you, I think, meant to say there's nothing to the other side of it. Well, isn't this just a, a, a mm -hmm. further illustration of the point you were making before, that there's so much that we uh, rely on on men of the mind for, not just the material products that they create, but the concepts they give us and the, the teaching uh, that they, and, the, and the, ped the pedagogies and the uh -huh. methods of learning that they, that right. they create. They and so there's a lot that we can, like we can get from them, a lot of tools that we can acquire, and, uh, but and so we I might wanna, be left on our own if we're not. I want to move on to other oh. aspects of this vulnerability to the mystics. So Galt says the mystics, are, I think germs, I forget the word to use, who attack you through a single sewer. So what's the sewer? I mean, we've been talking about it um, already. Ben, could you pull up that passage? I think a single sewer should get you to it. Yeah. Uh, mystics of both schools who preach the creed of sacrifice are germs that attack you through a single sewer your fear of relying on your mind. They tell you that they possess a means of knowledge higher than the mind, a mode of consciousness superior to reason, like a special pull with some bureaucrat of the universe who gives them secret tips withheld from others. Right, so here's this idea of the fear of independence, or fear of independent thinking, which is carrying what you were stressing, is, uh, is what's um, driving people to mysticism. If you are fully self-confident in your independent judgment, which amounts to having full self-esteem, um, you will be invulnerable to the mystics. And we'll see how self-esteem figures really prominently in the third part of the speech. The other one, and I think that's connected to this, is, um, can you pull up the, the passage whenever you've any part of their creed? Um, we'll get a, here's the passage that I've been alluding to a number of times there, already. This is from the, there is no honest revolt against yes. reason. And when you accept any part of their creed, your motive is to get away with something your reason would not permit you to attempt. Mm -hmm. The freedom you seek is freedom from the fact that if you stole your wealth, you are a scoundrel, no matter how much you give to charity or how many prayers you recite, and it goes on to give other examples. Like yeah, that. and it gives a lot of examples of fairly petty uh, things that you might be trying to cheat on or hide yourself from. Well, I don't the, know if your wife is something petty to cheat on. To cheat on. Well, it's like the cookies I stole. And that the, comes up. Yeah, so, so I, mean, I mean petty as well as it, 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 it's from it's the... What? It's a mix, yeah. But it includes, you know, fairly small things. So it's the desire to ex ex exempt little things from reason. Maybe it mounts and then there are bigger and bigger things, right? Is um, what gives you a stake in what the, the mystics are doing on a grand scale. And the result is a kind of conspiracy. And we, we get this reference to conspiracy right around that passage, right, Ben? Um, for the same, that's at, that's paragraph 155 and on page 137, 1037, and the conspiracy stuff is not until later. Right? Okay, can you pull so that up? About 10 pages later, uh, paragraph 204 says 1046 for okay. the conspiracy stuff. Is. And what is the conspiracy stuff? Uh, 
you who've never grasped the nature of your evil, you who describe them as misguided idealists, may the God you invented forgive you. They are the essence of evil. They are those anti-living objects who seek uh, by devouring the world to fill the selfless zero of their soul. It's not your wealth thereafter. There's a cons theirs is a conspiracy against the mind, which means against life and man. But then in, this, in the paragraphs that follow, we get more of a description of the nature of the conspiracy. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not this grand uh, conspiracy led by omnipotent uh, beings. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of conspiracy that, that Stadler noticed that he was caught up in right. around the but time of Project X and that, that, that uh, Reardon observed it's that a kind of oil was a part of. It's a kind of conspiracy, though, that there's a, a kind of involvement in, insofar as you're trying to evade some fact. And so you reach for the things that will help you put out of mind some facts. And other people are also trying to avoid some facts. And so they'll settle together on doctrines and ways of living that will help them avoid the facts. And so it's a conspiracy. That's the and, and that's the next paragraph. It's a, it's a conspiracy without leader or direction. And the random little thugs of the moment who cash, it, cash in on the agony of one land or, land or another are chance scum riding the torrent from the broken dam of the sewer of centuries. Uh, so it, it, it's like these bad ideas got into the atmosphere some somehow but they serve a they serve a, a to rationalize some need of somebody for self-esteem right. and people glom on to them and the little holes in people's self-esteem due to their little evasions and little fears of independence make them give uh, the power of the most of them which is better to the people who are worse than them who are more driven by this who then give more power to the people who are more driven and in that way the people who are the worst uh, come to come to power, or come to get the power that they have. That's, I think, the idea. You you often see, and I think we were talking about this a little bit before the broadcast with Al, when Ayn Rand does uh, contemporary cultural analysis in various uh, uh, nonfiction essays that she did. She is she is frequently dismisses the conspiratorial view of history that there are secret interests who are. Uh, orchestrating things in order to, you know, get all the money for themselves or something, mm -hmm. and instead she focuses on the role of the transmission of philosophic ideas. And if there's an appearance of a, of mm -hmm. a grand conspiracy, it's it's that people accept the same ideas because they have the same kind of needs that these ideas rationalize. Who just said he's a nut online? Who just said who's a nut? <laughs> Someone just came on. Uh, saying he guesses he's uh, I I have I can see your comments but can't see who they're from because of a glitch in our software. Ben can see who they're from. I guess I'm a, just a nut because I'm a Christian but really like objectivism, enjoying this very much. Who is that? That's Tom. Tom. So um, thanks for your comment, Nutty Tom. We have um, I think we have in the room and I'm sure watching a lot online other people who are Christians or uh, think of themselves as Christians or believers of one uh, religion or another who find a lot that they admire in, uh, in Rand. And whether you're a nut or not, I don't know. I think it's, um, Rand represents a really radical and different philosophy. And it shouldn't be something that when you encounter it, um, you, you know, this is something you have to think about whether it's true and whether all the parts of it are true or just some of the parts of it. And uh, that usually takes time. And, uh, you know, Robert here would have counted as a nut from his uh, first reading of The Fountainhead till he, whenever it is that he decided uh, he, he wasn't, so, so he had six months of uh, what you would call nuttiness, but I don't think it's nutty. It's, uh, I think the, I think Rand and Galt are right that religion is inconsistent with the other aspects uh, and with probably what it is, Tom, that you value in her ideas. But these kind of things aren't self-evident. And so long as you are interested in what's true and interested in leading the best life for yourself and taking all of these ideas, uh, whether you're getting them from Atlas Shrugged or from Christianity or from Kant or from Karma or from whatever, and thinking, how can I tell if this is true and how can I use it to better my life, then, uh, then hopefully you'll reach the right answers, whether and they're the ones I think are the right ones or not. There's also a difference, isn't there, between, between accepting an idea uh, because of some path, some psychological need uh -huh. uh, or flaw, on the one hand, 
and being a nut, right? Mm-hmm. She is she is not saying that Or just the, accepting an idea because you're mistaken. So there there's mistakes that aren't nutty. There are mistakes that are nutty. There are mistakes that are vicious or wicked in some way. And their most mistakes are combinations of a lot of different factors. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, let's see, I became a Christian when I was in fifth grade. Not now. Uh-huh. I'm no longer a Christian, but that happened in fifth grade. In my early 20s, uh-huh. I rejected that. Uh-huh. And uh, from my memories, I don't think it was because of any psychological reason. I think I was just ignorant, ignorant and naive, well, as, as far as I can remember. Do we have anyone who's... Um, I mean, Will, you're involved with a church. I don't know exactly what your role is, but in the governance of it. So do you want to comment from a non, oh, in my foolish youth perspective on, on religion and your thoughts on it? Well, you know, I, I intended to go into my usual spiel because I feel that I was a Swedenborgian all along. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know there was a label for it. Mm-hmm. And when I started reading his theology, I said, aha, so this is how it fits together. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe something because Swedenborg says so, mm-hmm. or because the spirit said so to him. I believe it because it makes sense. So all of us have to figure out as best we can what makes sense. And I think some answers are right and others are wrong. I don't need to be skeptical or agnostic about this. But um, realities, you know, in the in the sense, the final judge. But you've got to be the final. You're the only one who could judge for yourself what's real. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sure. I think it's probably part of a larger discussion ultimately, but if you can imagine like a kid who goes to a school and you can, let's just say he's born and he's got a, an ability to think rationally, and then he goes into the school and you've got a system which is ultimately either explicitly in some cases or implicitly in other cases hostile towards the development of a, of a rational faculty and the ability of a, a rational faculty to induce concepts and, and validate them and integrate them prove something is right or wrong, and we'll explicitly say sometimes that there's no such thing as right or wrong, or it's all what you think, it's all subjective. And so you can imagine like a kid over time uh, who may have otherwise become rational, all of a sudden he's now graduated an adult and he's got no ability quite literally to think or how to, to process ideas, and it becomes very difficult and you can see This that, sounds a lot like the situation of Tony the Wet Nurse, right? Sure, yeah, and, and then they, they, they end up looking towards um, uh, to a certain body of ideas, like what should I believe and what should I think, because they've gone through school and they've been throttled, so now it's what set of ideas should I believe in? Some of them go to Christianity or some form of religion, and other ones happen to find, you know, you're on broke on YouTube, and it kind of, <laughs> you can get a whole... Good, a whole thanks. Ben, I want to move on to the last section of the speech. Do you have any last thoughts before we do that? I had a question for you, but I don't know if there's time to answer it, given that uh, there's still a lot about self-esteem to say, right. and maybe it'll come up under self-esteem. One thing to say generally is we're going to have some a few sessions after the novel's over, after we've read through all the novel, and we're going to return to a lot of different themes, and all the themes in Galt's speech are themes throughout the novel, so they're all fair game for things to return to. So we're going to shift now to the last section of the speech, the section on, on Choose Life. And there are a few topics to cover under this. But the first one um, we want to talk about is self-esteem. And uh, Ben, you want to start us off on that with some you know, ideas from the forum? Uh, well, we, we asked a question about, I forget what the text of it is, all of a sudden well, it seems to be missing from the notes. But, um, we just asked what his view of self-esteem what, is and, and the role And a few is. people yeah. chimed in. Schuyler mentioned that it was the the last of the cardinal values that he mentions along with reason and purpose and yeah. in that context let's just say what uh, how he defines it um, elsewhere I forget if it's in Galt's speech but uh, Ren talks about self-esteem as the conviction that your mind is capable of knowing and your person is worthy of, I don't think of that's in this happiness which means worthy of living that's in um, in the article the objectivist ethics yeah and in that same article uh, he relates self-esteem in particular to the virtue of pride. Uh, in Galt's speech, Galt says that pride is the sum of the virtues. Um, so that's, I think, just some picking up on some of what Schuyler said. What are some of the other uh, content we have uh, from the forum? J.G. Uh, mentioned that 
self-esteem, I assume he means the possession of self-esteem, is the final proof of the morality of life. Uh, I take it that he means that you've been living by the morality of life, the way that you bring your essential you into tangible form. Well, I thought JG might have been picking up on, and JG, if you're in the chat, please chime in uh, on this. Um, I thought what he might have been referring to when he talked about the proof is the passage in which Galt says uh, to his audience that your need for self-esteem is the proof within your soul of my morality. Um, now, Galt talks about self-esteem in proof in a couple of connections. At one point he says the proof of a um, achieved self-esteem is, is one thing. And, and it might be that um, JG was referring to that. The proof of an achieved self-esteem is that you bristle at the idea of sacrificing yourself. The, the whole very idea of it's just, you know, obviously evil and wrong and disturbing. And um, maybe that was the passage he was talking about. But there's also this idea that um, the, the fact that people need self-esteem and feel that they need self-esteem, which is what makes it difficult for them to break with the morality of death once they've accepted it, and this goes again to the issues of dependence and independence. Um, they've invested their self-esteem in this code. They feel the need to try to live up to this code or at least pretend to because they need self-esteem. That's what's stopping them from fully going over to Galt's code. Um, and yet that need is the proof uh, within their soul thinks Galt, of Galt's code um, that, one, uh, that one needs uh, that, that you need self-esteem, which, of course, Galt thinks is one of the three supreme and ruling values you need to live as a human being, uh, the others being reason and purpose. So this is kind of an, another example of mm -hmm. a sort of uh, parasitism, then, that even though the person's explicit value system is directed against the self and against self-esteem, mm -hmm. uh, even in order to uh, be motivated by that system, they need to rely on a kind of self-esteem. Yeah, I think that's right. And the other, I think, really significant thing Galt says about self-esteem, um, he thinks people have betrayed their pride and self-esteem under uh, their nascent self-esteem, uh, under the morality of death, right? It has led them to uh, achieve, betray what self-esteem they were developing in their childhood prior to, to, to um, falling fully under its sway, and those moments of self-esteem that they've had and he sees this, this kind of betrayed self-esteem or betrayed potential for self-esteem as the real reference of all of these legends, uh, like the legend of Atlantis or of a Garden of Eden or of, you know, some better time and man has since fallen, but it used to be good for us. There used to be this sunlit thing in the race's past. So and he says that doesn't exist in the past of the species, but in your own past there was a time before you... Since this comes up in the context of this... Uh, repudiation of original sin and, mm -hmm. and the idea of the fall. Is, is she advocating for some kind of original virtue? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't think so. I, think, I mean, she definitely would say that she isn't because she talks elsewhere about original virtue that is the opposite of original sin, thinking we're good by nature as a mistake. We're neither good nor bad by nature. We're what we choose to be. But the um, there's a Think of the way Francisco puts it when he's talking about the valley. He says, like, what's possible to us on an unobstructed earth? So there's this idea of, like, what's possible to human beings. We can build it and create it and can have this joyous life, uh, this wonderful, splendorous life. But it's a challenge to do it, but it's a challenge, you know, you might start off, and I think most people start off playful and eagerly wanting to meet. It's not yet virtue. It's just that's what being alive is like when you're a kid and, and you haven't given up. Um, virtue is what you achieve uh, as you, uh, you know, a good character anyway, is what you achieve as you uh, develop towards this and develop particular values and particular character traits and develop an earned confidence in yourself. What you have at the beginning is just the kind of material for that. So, but what's the difference? But there's a kind of betraying of that that she thinks happens or Galt thinks happens. What's the difference then between saying we don't have any choice about our need for self-esteem, mm -hmm. which she seems to accept, uh, mm -hmm. and saying everybody's selfish, which she definitely denies, and we talked more about that last, last time. Well, you don't have any choice about any of your needs. You, the need for self-esteem just means you won't be able to function. Uh, if, you won't be able to work to sustain yourself if you think that you're awful and not worthy of living and not capable of living, just like you won't be able to function if you don't eat and you won't be able to function if you don't drink 
and you won't be able to function if you don't do any of these other things. Um, but you don't automatically actually pursue those things. You automatically, what do you do? You automatically feel a deficit if you lack those things. But that's different from automatically pursuing them. And it's Because what you can do is try to fake away that deficit. And that is what's going on it's a lot different of the from, Is it also different from wanting to have self-esteem? I think so. Because if, if it were, everybody wanted self-esteem, and that would be... That would be some kind of motive that unites everybody, but she's not saying that. I don't think so, and I don't think she's saying that self-esteem is our basic motive either, which is what you, it's just, it's one need that we have, an important one. Okay. Um, but we can have a whole discussion, maybe this is a good topic for, I have a list of topics I'm, I'm, I'm kind of keeping for uh, when we come back at the end of the novel, and maybe self-esteem is, is one to do. Yeah, yeah Anna? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's a good topic, because I think it's one that a lot of people misunderstand or they judge self-esteem based on maybe superficial things rather than an abstract understanding of, of, of ideas or, or, or of your own life or you know, whatever So here's you a, a really big topic that we haven't covered yet and I don't think we have time to cover it tonight so I'll just say let's make this one of the major topics and it was always going to be that um, that we're going to address afterwards though it feels weird to say almost nothing about it when reading called speech but I think we should just skip it which is the concept of individual rights and trade I think I'll just say this much about it we asked a question about it but I, I think we can just say the following things about it now um, Galt thinks people owe one another what they owe everything they deal with, what they owe reality and themselves, rationality. Um, what rationality means in dealing with people is in particular justice. And that includes, um, that includes uh, justice and productiveness, not trying to uh, earn your, get your living from other people, but earn it for all the reasons we've discussed before when we talked about the conflicts of interest. And this means uh, you should approach other people as traders, trading value for value, something we've talked a lot about. And there are two kind of related contrasts to approaching people as a trader. Uh, begging for sacrifices or wanting sacrifices from them. So that trade is to mutual advantage rather than is sacrificial as one element of trade. And the other important element of trade, which is especially highlighted in, in Galt's speech, is that trades occur by persuasion, not by force. So just the fact that I know that it would be better for Earl if we engaged in this deal doesn't mean I get to go over and you know take his thing and give him my money. Um, it's not a trade unless we agree to it. Trades take place by persuasion, in which case each people each person is free to go his own way. If he doesn't judge, that he benefits by it. And Galt puts a special emphasis on its force, the non-initiation of force. You have to agree not to initiate force against other people um, that, um, uh, to live together in society. And um, so that's one big element of what we owe others according to Galt. Another element of justice that we owe others according to Galt is recognizing what values we get from them. And here I just want to mention um, one topic before we move to the last topic for tonight, which is how Galt thinks the strike is going to end. Um, and that's what Galt called, what's called sometimes the pyramid of ability. So the idea is, um, we get this idea coming out of Marx that the entrepreneur, the business person is an exploiter. And we get some of the negative characters saying the, the strong exploit the weak and so forth. But Galt's view is really quite the opposite. When people engage in trade, um, everyone benefits, so no one's exploited. <laughs> But in particular, the less able benefit more from the more able than the inverse, um, because the less able only have so much to offer. And the example Galt gives is if you work for Hank Reardon, and if you do mere manual labor for Hank Reardon, you're at the bottom, you're the sweeper, like the wet nurse wanted to be in the factory. Well, all you're doing is sweeping up, and you could have swept up, you know, in primitive times, and you only would have gotten what a caveman would have get, gotten from sweeping the dust out of his cave, which is almost nothing. Whereas if you're drawing a salary from Reardon Metal, it's because of Reardon. Uh, he did build that. He did build that. <laughs> no, I want to yeah. say yeah. one more thing before you move on to the mm -hmm. stuff about uh, the end game, because this section about rights uh, mm -hmm. comes in the same place as Galt is talking about America, and uh, this is the country they want to rebuild because it was the country founded on reason, mm -hmm. but that it faces a choice 
uh, it, the choices between America and the mystics. Uh, you can't have it both ways because mm -hmm. because mysticism is against reason and because reason is the foundation of mm -hmm. rights. And I think it's really important that this is there's a way in which this is coming full circle from the very beginning of the book. If you remember, uh, in the very first chapter, in the very first scene, Eddie Willers is reflecting on his time growing mm -hmm. up in his childhood with Dagny and mm -hmm. about about the preacher who always said you need to find the best within you right. and he doesn't know what the best within right. him is mm -hmm. and so Eddie is kind of your paradigm case of average American uh, who's who's who faces this this who's been put into the situation where there's this basic contradiction in the culture uh, and Hank Reardon too who's more than an average American but he's still kind of symbolic of the America at, at its best. Mm -hmm. And even he is being undercut by this mysticism because of the mind-body dichotomy that's crept into his... Which is part of the morality of death. Yeah. Which is part of the morality of death. And, and he, of course, does finally make a choice. And that's why he thinks that what he's discovering as he starts is to discover a is a new continent that should have been discovered along with America. That's why there's the, um, the allusions to maybe Atlantis is yeah. America or what America could have or should have been and will now be. And, and part of what's enabled him to do this is not just because of golf, but I mean, a lot of it he's figured out on its own, is, mm -hmm. is figuring out what really is the best yeah. within him. And it is, it is his mind, which we get more on in the speech about how the mind mm -hmm. is the self. And when you yeah. have self-esteem, so, it's, it's esteem in your mind. So how does Galt think we're going to get there? How is this strike going to finish the task and help us rebuild America? We got um, Schuyler and Merrill said a little bit about this online uh, when we asked this question of what Galt's endgame is. And I, there was a lot right, I think, in what both of them said about the kind of society that Galt would want to set up, one in which um, reason, purpose, and self-esteem are recognized and protected, said Schuyler. Um, uh, Merrill says, in the world that we'll have after this, um, men will be safe to, uh, for men to trade with one another freely, and each one will own his life and his mind and his property. But there's something in both answers that I think is not quite right. So Schuyler speaks of the strikers are coming back and averting the world crisis. But I don't think that's right. I think Galt's view is we're going to let this crisis run all the way to the end. Um, uh, and um, Merrill says that the strike will end when man's rights are protected by government, as though the government's going to reform itself and start to protect rights, and then the strikers will come back, which is what Daphne more or less thinks will happen, right? At some point, the government's going to uh, change their ways and start decontrolling, and then the strikers will come back. Uh, but this isn't what Galt thinks. Galt thinks this is going to run till the end. And what that means is he thinks society is going to totally collapse into like a prehistoric, savage state of warring tribes, which is the ideal which is the kind of state of the nation that is implied by their beliefs. And that what's going to happen is the strikers are going to, I mean, how does he, I think he views the state of the world at the culmination of the strike. New York City is going to go out. The lights are going to go out. It's going to be like, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire. It's going to be, you know, hordes of tribes fighting each other in civil war, a total technological, a dark age. And then within that dark age, there are going to be, as he puts it, hidden outposts of civilization. The valley is the chief one. Maybe other communities that other people inspired by his speech will have built. Maybe some of these deserters who have already left and are roaming around, maybe some of them have good communities they've built that Galt doesn't know about. But whatever... Um, it's not going to be the society is going to all turn around together at once. The society is going to collapse, and then there are going to be these little better communities around. And things are going to grow out from there. So Galt says he's going to open his city, that is the valley, right, to the people who share his ideas. And that city will act as a rallying point for other similar communities. And that somehow they're going to build out from there and take back over the continent. And the world, ultimately. Francisco has said this in the Valley, but it'll all emanate out from Galt's cult USA. So I think Galt's perspective is that what they're going to be is very much like a colonizing power uh, who has a superior culture and superior set of ideas, making little beachhead communities in a new world, and then kind of build up and build up a country from there. And, and this 
you know, savages have never been able to stop civilized people from uh, moving civilization forward, right? He makes a comment like that. Um, very much implies that he's seeing what the strikers and their communities are going to be like as like what the Euro European communities were or should have or could have been uh, in a new world. And he thinks other people from outside of those communities will come to join them and join together with them and be won over to their cause and somehow together they'll rebuild this society. But we don't get many details about how it's going to work. We'll get some more or a little bit more insight into this in the last chapter um, where we see some reflection on it. Perhaps it has to be left to the fan fiction. But I think, uh, I think it's worth thinking about how they think a society can be rebuilt and how much is described in the novel about how they think the society will be rebuilt and how much isn't and why we get what we get and not more and not less. And that's one of the topics I hope we'll come back to, uh, come back to afterwards. Uh, how this will lead to ultimately having a whole country again rather than, um, rather than a bunch of little communities, especially since these communities are not countries. They're, they're little private hidden groups right, that are defending themselves by secrecy and only people are allowed there by invitation. Uh, if what they want to be is the United States of America again, as is implied by the fact that that's what's on their money, then presumably they want to be a, a whole country that isn't just a bunch of private clubs, and somehow they think they're going to get back to that. And uh, there's a question as to how they'll do that, um, and we can talk about that in, in one of our after sessions. So let's just end with Galt's advice to people. And his advice in general to the people on the world is what? Go on strike. Yeah, yeah. go on strike. Same thing I'm doing. And that means work at a subsistence level if you have to within the society. If you're able to get outside of it on your own or with some friends and form a new community somewhere like we've done, you know, do that and we'll, after the, everything goes to hell, we'll kind of, you know, uh, connect with you guys. Uh, and then his last of his words, as he puts it, are addressed to, addressed to the hidden heroes within society. And it's very clear that this in particular means to Daphne, right? Do you hear me, my love, he says. And we get here Galt's view of what Daphne's error is. Um, so let me just read that passage. Your destroyers hold you by means of your endurance, your generosity, your innocence, your love. The endurance that carries their burden, the generosity that responds to their cries of despair, the innocence that is unable to conceive of their evil and gives them the benefit of every doubt, refusing to condemn them without understanding and incapable of understanding a motive, such, such motives as theirs. The love, your love of life, which makes you believe that they are men and that they love it too. So this is Galt's diagnosis of why Daphne hasn't gone on strike yet. She's, um, her endurance, uh, generosity, and especially innocence, inability to conceive of what the looters are, and her love of life, which makes, which is so profound that it makes her blind to the possibility of an opposite motive, um, makes her unable to understand people like Jim. But, Walt continues, the world of today is the world they wanted, and life is their object of hatred. And so his advice to her is leave them the death they, to the death they worship. Don't exhaust the greatness of your soul on achieving the triumph of the evil of there. And his, oh, go ahead, Ben. Uh, on the, 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 the passages that follow from this mm -hmm. immediately uh, are some of, I think, the most beautiful writing in the book. The, uh, in the name of the best within you, don't let your fire go out, spark by irreplaceable spark. And you get this quoted all over the place. I mean, it mm -hmm. even makes it into primetime TV shows sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's interesting that you never get the next paragraph quoted, uh, which is, okay, the world you desire can be one and it exists, it's real, it's possible, it's yours, which you've heard uh -huh. from Galt once before to Dagny, in yeah. the valley. But then, but to win it requires your total dedication and a total break with the world of your past, with the mm -hmm. doctrine that man is a sacrificial animal who exists right. for the pleasure of others. So yeah. on the one hand, this is, this is something that, that he's you know, reminding Dagny about that, yes, you can mm -hmm. have this idealism 
uh, that you've always thought that you did, but it <laughs> requires breaking with the world and its code. Uh, and the people, I think it's, I think it's interesting that people love to quote the previous paragraph, but not, but not this part because mm -hmm. this is the hard part. This is the radical part. Yeah. That they like the the glowing idealism. They don't like what it requires of them. And these are the people I think who Galt would think of as not like the Dabneys, but like the people who are his audience for most of the speech. And what he says to them is, look, you've been accepting this other code. You've been living life by this other code. Although secretly you've never really, part of you've never really bought it. Um, you've held this morality, but you've held it in this joyless way. You've in effect, it amounts to holding that morality is a necessary evil. You've gotten on this train that's kind of gotten worse and worse. Um, now's the time. You can follow it. You can die and suffer and have this awful life for the sake of a morality that you've kind of bought into by default. Or you can challenge it. You can accept the alternative. You can fight a fight where your victories won't be these transient things that evaporate and your you know, normal state is suffering and things getting worse and worse, but where your setbacks are transient and overcomable, where you'll be able to achieve more and more, where you'll be climbing to higher and higher heights. And if you don't reach full sunlight, you'll at least reach a level touched by its rays. And that's Galt's message to the people who don't want to, his last paragraph, I think. Um, I think that's a good place for us to end. And uh, we'll see you guys next week to discuss Chapter 8. Uh, ben from back in Louisiana, uh, me from here, and I hope all of you guys will join us, and all of you on the internet. And we'll make our way through through the end of the book, and you'll be back with us after the book for those supplemental sessions. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.